I want to briefly look at another poem by Philip Larkin called This Be the Verse. It's one of his more famous poems, <coughs> short, and if we think about why it's famous, then it's probably about its style, about the method of communication, the way the writer communicates his feelings. I think that probably Larkin was a very conservative kind of guy, but uh, in spite of his conservatism, he he expressed himself sometimes in fairly wild ways, and it's this kind of wildness that most people seem to enjoy the most about Larkin. I feel when he's expressing his deep ideas and thoughts, poems like Wits and Weddings or Church Going, things like that, it's really uh, not as good as his more feisty poems. We are confronted in his serious poems with a rather a dull character, really, who is not really sure about anything, and okay, there's nothing wrong with that, maybe, but he, he is just a very, very traditional kind of guy with many hang-ups who... Uh, went through the English public school system and in many ways finds it difficult to express himself. Um, and so we know that when he he expresses himself in such uh, direct ways and some of his poems, that it's, it's, it's a weight off his chest and a delight to us as well. And it's a good example of how sometimes the style is more more important than the content when we see the content of Larkin's more serious poems, we see that he it was rather sad, actually, in many ways. His life was rather sad. He was a, he was he had a good job. He was a head librarian at Hull University, but uh, if you look at his personal life, it seemed to be full of hang-ups and full of difficulties, uh, repressions. A very typical kind of public school upbringing where he wasn't able to express his emotions and he he came to a point where he found it very difficult to 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 really say what he actually thought in a direct way except through this this uh, style he developed sometimes in some of his poems where he's extraordinarily forceful and direct and in a, a very unusual way uh, these are some of his best poems, actually, and as I said before, as with uh, Naturally the Foundation will bear your expenses. Um, it's really the style that is more interesting than the, than the content in many ways. Although, uh, yeah, as a fictional figure in Naturally the Foundation will bear your expenses, the character is perhaps more interesting than Larkin was himself. Uh, so, yeah, maybe the first thing I should do is just read the poem, which won't take long. Uh, before I do that, I should just uh, mention, be because I might forget, that uh, just on the theme of Larkin's real beliefs, there's no evidence that he was anything other than conservative with a small c and a rather repressed public school product. But uh, it's worth noting that his father was a fascist sympathizer and uh, supported some very right-wing characters such as Oswald Mosley, the leader of the Black Shirts in the UK. So did any of this rub off on on Larkin, we don't know. So, you know, did, did he resent his parents for, or his father for, for such beliefs? We don't know, as we would expect from such a tight-lipped kind of guy. He really said nothing about that, about things like this. Um, just perhaps gave us a few brief clues in his poems. So let's read the poem. This be the verse. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. 
They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had, and add some extra just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn, by fools in old-style hats and coats, who half the time were soppy stern, and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man, it deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as quickly as you can, and don't have any kids yourself. This be the verse is reference to a poem Requiem by Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, that's much less ironic poem. That's not, not an ironic poem. This is almost wholly ironic, I think, although also deeply felt at the, at the same time. So this be the verse. This is this is the these are the words that will tell you how things really, really are, really stand. If we look at the structure, it's very simple. It's kind of classical format. Three quatrains. Um, iambic tetrameter. It's all eight syllables a line. And the meter is very clearly iambic most of the time. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. So, what were... And the rhymes, uh, there are two rhymes in each quatrain. Dad, had, do, you. Always a bit more difficult to put two rhymes in a stanza because you limit the vocabulary you can use. So, it's kind of... Uh, you're kind of showing off how well you can use words, it's uh, the fact that you're you are limited by this rhyming you are saying is not a problem for you, you can always think of appropriate words so, and it certainly does something to increase the frequency and the quality of the music strange to talk about the music in a poem that is full of obscenities anyway, um doesn't really need a lot of analysis. It's pretty clear what he's saying. And if we think about his background in terms of repressed Englishman, public school, maybe a literary career that never fully took off, and he became a, a librarian, then later in life his poetry became very popular, but often more for the style rather than the content, I think, as I, as I said before. So we see it's very heartfelt by the obscenity in the first line. I believe that after his father died in the 1940s, Larkin often went to visit his, his mother in the holidays, Christmas holidays, Easter holidays, um, and it's very likely that this poem was written after a long spell staying with his mother, which may have deepened his feelings. It's often the case that when people spend long periods of time with family members, they the, the repressions of the past come to the forefront, and that might have happened here. So let's uh, let's look at it. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. So, obviously your parents don't mean to screw you over, but he says they do anyway. Why? Why? Because they fill you with the faults they had. And ironically, he adds, and adds some extra just for you. Presumably these faults are partly genetic, any physical faults they have in their body are going to be communicated to you through through the genes, and then they also have a tremendous influence over your view of the world as you're growing up, and you, you of course, you rely on the parents so much for early direction. So they fill you with the faults they had, and add some extra just for you. It's a very dark 
point of view, he could have said they they give you their the qualities, they, they communicate their qualities to you, but no, it's they give you the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But then he is tries to be understanding, but they were fucked up in their turn by fools and old style hacks and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. I guess that when he says soppy stern, he means kind of sentimental. They probably could be violent, these people, but they were also, that went hand in hand with a certain sentimentalism. They were fucked up in their turn by old, old by fools and old style hats and coats. So, yeah, perhaps they're referring to the stiff upper lipped British upper middle class tradition where emotions were not really expressed very much and you were just expected to get on and do your duty and young people were sent off to boarding schools where they they, they, they were expected to do well at games and do well at classics and they often never saw their parents for long periods of time and became repressed and uh, their emotions were and they found their, it was difficult to express their emotions so I think Larkin definitely belonged to this group and he says that the parents who were enforcing this system they were fucked up in their turn by fools and old style hats and coats so presumably other people like themselves I don't know school teachers and and uh, probably priests and people like that people in authority who all had one point of view and you had to act in this way and you were an anomaly if you didn't and uh, the problem for Larkin is that he always did exactly what he was supposed to do, really. It's only in his poems that he expresses a little bit of, of uh, feistiness. In terms of his life, it seems that he always just followed the line of least resistance, and, or perhaps he believed in it. It's deep down in his heart. It's... it's, it's it's the way things are, and or the way things were, and his parents had lived their lives in that way, and they passed that way of living on to him as well. But obviously, he wasn't happy. They were fucked up in their turn by fools and old style hats and coats, who half the time were soppy stern. So half the time they were sentimental and nothing. Uh, not really talking about problems in a real way, either stern or else sentimental, avoiding deep consideration of issues and half at one another's throats. So the dissatisfaction expressed itself also in terms of disagreements and arguments and they could be quite violent, at least verbally. And certainly in other ways too, at these public schools uh, in the 19th century and early 20th century, uh, corporal punishment was normal. And uh, many beatings were regularly handed out to, to uh, the boarders. So these people, half the time they were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. And then the last verse is a kind of, uh, he, he wants to make a general point. He wants to make his specific situation an example of a, a general point about humanity. Well, I'm not sure you can really extrapolate from Larkin's particular ex experience to mankind as a whole. Perhaps that's what he would like. That, yeah, everybody is like me, and I, I had a hard time, but I, I saw and I suffered. But this is the only way we can live, and we have to do what we're 
we are told to do, but of course actually there are other ways to live your life, and Larkin came from a particular background, but yeah, he, he didn't always have to do exactly what he was told, he, he did it because it was suitable for him, and he was the kind of person who in the end enjoyed, uh, well, maybe enjoyed is the wrong word, but he, he accepted that uh, this was the right way. But anyway, he goes on to, to make this general point, extrapolating from the first two stanzas. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as quickly as you can, and don't have any kids yourself. It could hardly be more bleak, um, despairing, depressed. So there's nothing much to hope for at all, except just presumably do what's required of you and and be miserable, live your life uh, in this miserable way, and then just if you if you if you have to hand on your misery to your children and to the next generation, and. Uh, if you do that, presumably the status quo will be uh, will be satisfied, even though you will be deeply unhappy. So, it's really very strong and extreme. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Well, that's a nice image in a poem where there hasn't really been much imagery until now. It kind of feels like it's this is a great image of the poem, and he he trots it out. Um, it's a nice one. It's a simile. Man, man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. So misery is always getting greater, like the coastal sh shelf is always expanding. And then in the last two lines, the the very bleakest of despair, the bleakest despair, get out as quickly as you can. Presumably he means die as quickly as you can <coughs> and don't have any kids yourself. So don't be in a situation where you have to pass on this misery to another generation, to other people. Just endure your own misery and die as soon as you can and uh, get out without, without passing it on to the next generation. It couldn't be more miserable, really, the, the conclusion. And one can feel a bit sorry for Larkin. That it's, it's, the format is deeply ironic, but at the same time, one cannot mistake the pain here. And this is a man who has endured a lot through repression of emotions. And he has suffered so much. Um, he didn't live a long life, as it turned out. I think he was maybe 60-something. Died rather suddenly. And he didn't have any kids either. So, he kind of followed his own advice, perhaps. It's always difficult and dangerous to connect the poetry too much with the man, but this, in this case it seems that there is, there is a link, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's what I was talking about before, the, a kind of hung up public schoolboy type who was never able to fully express his emotions but was always taught to just do his duty and accept things happen in a particular way which can't be changed. Uh, it's, it's somebody like this uh, remonstrating with fate and saying, why did it have to be like this? Why does it have to be like this? Couldn't, couldn't it be better? But the only way it could have been better really was if he had been a different kind of person, if he had put up more of a fight against this very stodgy background that he was a part of, but in the end he, 
he just accepted it and sank into the stodginess. So it's a striking short little poem which is interesting to read but in the end it's re reflective of a deep despair in the life of the writer I think. Let me finish just by reading it one more time. This be the verse. They fuck you up your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn by fools in all style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half in one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as quickly as you can and don't have any kids yourself.